without any further ado, I'm pleased to open up our next session. And as a reminder, you're welcome to stay here. You're also welcome to pop in the lounge and network a little bit, although you're definitely not going to want to miss what we're what we're talking about now. I'm I I I, I, I say with confidence that we're with three um, three of Rwanda's best and brightest, three of my uh, closest friends from the country as well. So I'm very pleased to be getting in the mindset that we're sitting over a good cup of coffee together at a, at a shop in Kigali. I invite you to get into that mind space and join us. We're going to talk about the ease of doing business in Rwanda. And I'm very blessed to have the perspectives here of JJ, Israel, and Alex. And you don't want to hear me introduce these guys, trust me. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves real quick um, and, or, 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 or take as long as they need. I, I, I understand that Israel is a little short for time. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got to go save some lives with Zipline. So Israel, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you. We're talking about the ease of doing business in Rwanda, and we all want to hear the, the Zipline story of what, of what they've done and, and how it was for them. But also, to, but, but, but start by telling us your story. Tell us about your background, how you got to where you're at today, and, and what Zipline up to, and what have they done in Rwanda? What was it like for them? Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, uh, um, my name is Israel, and I currently work on the go-to-market team of Zipline, mostly uh, trying to make sure that Zipline expands to as many countries as possible across the continent. Um, I was one of the first employees of Zipline um, here in Rwanda and kind of worked to make sure that we are well integrated in the uh, aviation system, in the technology ecosystem, in the healthcare system. And I happen to be a pharmacist, so I kind of know the healthcare side, but I've also always been um, interested in the technology side of things and how you know policy and healthcare policy work more broadly so that's kind of how i worked on making sure that zipline fits really perfectly in the healthcare system here and i'm now in a position to be able to do it um, a, a bit more broadly and prior to zipline i was you know working as a consultant still in the drone space trying to help organizations understand um, how to use this new and novel technology for their goals and not only in terms of delivering medications but also um, doing mapping, doing data uh, collection, um, and, and uh, also donor organizations who wanted to be able to fund this type of initiatives. Um, and, and before that, I was, uh, I was still a student and I was president of the, the International Pharmacy Students Federation. So I happened to know pharmacy students in, in Israel um, and, and in surrounding countries. So it's, it's really great to be here. Um, for, as for Zipline story itself, I think uh, you know, one of the things that makes Zipline special first is the fact that, you know, we are at a frontier market. So it, it's one of those technologies that do not yet work, at least in 2016 before Zipline came. Um, no one knew how to regulate it, how to integrate it in the healthcare system, and how this type of business run. How does this type of business integrate in the communities, you know? Um, and in many other countries, it's usually something that... Uh, You'll know probably drones by the fact that you know you have one that's manned that you could use to take pictures and so on. But Zipline is different. We do fly from two distribution centers, cover the entire country, and our drones kind of make deliveries to hospitals. Um, they do fly above communities. We are based in cities outside the city, and so we have to do a lot of things. And and so really, what made Rwanda very special? Uh, for Zipline to be the first kind of drone startup in the world um, to launch a national scale drone delivery, but also Rwanda being the first country where we were able to do it, it really has to take something special. Um, healthcare and aviation are that intersection is very, very delicate. And uh, I think, you know, countries like Rwanda, uh, for, for you to really understand what goes on in the background, it, it has to take a very special place. Uh, countries like the US are only catching up. Countries like Israel, of course, are only catching up, and they are all coming to learn from regulators in Rwanda, from healthcare policymakers in Rwanda. And so it's a couple of things. I usually try and classify them into three things. I think we talked about the ease of doing business, but I think it's it's also extends to the ease of doing proof of concepts type of business, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
usually when you are doing business, there is a registry of business and what you're going to do. But when you're coming and say, I'm going to do something that you've never seen, I think it can take some time. But now Rwanda was really quickly able to adapt to even the, the proof of concept side of things, something that has never been done. It's a new technology that probably doesn't exist in the region or something like that. Um, and so that, that was one first thing that we realized like Rwanda had uniquely and had been uniquely positioning itself for compared to many other countries. Um, the second thing is when you are doing a proof of concept business, I think most countries were opening up their doors but really limiting it to a lab-like experiment. And for this type of thing to really work, for the future to really happen, it has to be quickly deployed in real life, in real situation, flying above cities, flying above roads, flying above mountains. And so Rwanda was really open to that as well. Um, but it also has to put Zipline on pressure. So we needed to have a, a client who pays for the service and who really expects a high standard of service delivery. And imagine giving us uh, the entire blood distribution outside the capital to a drone company that has never proved that it works. And no one knows if this thing works. And, and people's lives were on the line. You know, when someone calls Zipline and they say, we need a particular blood group, that means that someone is in an emergency room and they're expecting you to make each of those deliveries. And so that really pushes a company like ours to not take any of the delivery for granted. And it pushes our innovation to be really mindful. Um, it pushes our regulatory teams to really work uh, extensively on how that works. Um, and then the third thing, it's, it's what I just spoke about. It's the regulatory environment. I think both on the healthcare side, but also on the aviation side, there was no one who has ever regulated drone delivery of medical products or drone delivery themselves. And so, I think it was really important that the regulators be able to adapt to, to this technology. And without having any international regulation to refer back to any developed countries uh, that has done this to kind of learn from, I think Rwanda was just at the forefront of being able to create the first templates and the first draft. And then everyone had to come here. Initially, it was what we call a performance-based regulation. But as Zipline operated and all parties started learning, I think we got into now creating the appropriate regulation based on what the industry uh, is and, and what kind of operations are being done. And there is also that flexibility because I think almost every year when Zipline requests for exemption, we actually notice that there is a, a process of changing regulation. So having that, um, and yesterday I was even talking to government officials and they are really creating um, some sort of a, a, a policy laboratory. So to create that flexibility in adapting regulation to the trends, you know, in social media, in uh, data privacy online, but also in things like drones and, you know, maybe soon taxi, flying taxis and so on. So you really need a place where they, they are, uh, they see the future from that, that perspective. I think that's, that's really what got us started here. And that's got, what got us really successful here. In, in many other countries, even when Zipline gets started, I think it's always small and, and it takes quite time to scale. But here we are really at scale. We operate uh, in the entire country. We sometimes even operate in some uh, uh, restricted air spaces, but uh, we, we're really operating successfully. So um, uh, Caleb, I think that, that's it for a start. Um, and, and happy to, to take any questions. I'm still around until the top of the hour, so um, I look forward to engaging in this conversation. Thank you so much. I, I, I cannot script, script, script a story better myself. You know, you, you, you launch drones and you launch our panel sessions even, even higher than that, my friend. So good to hear from you as always. Your insights are just uh, incredible. Uh, next, I'm gonna pass it over to my friend, uh, Alex Mtale. Alex, tell us about yourself, your journey, your story, your organization, mm -hmm. and how it um, how it enables ease of doing business in Rwanda, international partners. Um, uh, th thank you very much, Caleb, and uh, thank you everyone who has put this together. Uh, I see we have uh, quite a big audience. Um, and I really want to appreciate you again uh, for, uh, for organizing this. Uh, my name is Alex Sinhari. Uh, I'm also a friend of Israel and 
the ambassador. Uh, he's really uh, a rocking ambassador. So, um, so my name is Alex, and uh, my, my background um, is, is is computer science, and uh, uh, I, I studied when school in, in Uganda uh, at Macquarie University, and uh, did my bachelor's there uh, in yeah. computer science, and, and moved on to do other things. So today, uh, we since we started um, the the chamber. Uh, I represent the ICT Chamber, which is the umbrella organization for uh, technology companies in Rwanda uh, in the ICT space. Uh, but as you all may agree today, uh, that line is uh, quickly blurring uh, between what is ICT and what is not ICT. <laughs> I've just had Israel explain uh, how healthcare, aviation, ICT, um, all in one now morphing uh, into into one thing, which is uh, service delivery uh, powered by different types of technology. So, and, and that's really what's uh, what we are seeing uh, today. Our um, our sector is we have about uh, ten groupings um, in, in in the chamber uh, under the uh, different associations. So association for e-commerce and e-services, uh, we have FinTech, uh, we have hardware, uh, both manufacturers as well as distributors. Um, but without boring you um, with that kind of stuff, uh, maybe I can dive into the, the, the question that, um, that, that, that we're discussing today, which is the ease of doing, uh, ease of doing business. And His Excellency Ambassador touched the point of uh, when doing business, uh, promoting partnerships. And what we do at the ICT Chamber, we have about five uh, uh, strategic pillars or guiding pillars. Uh, one is to facilitate creation of new technology companies. Uh, so with that, we have uh, quite a number of uh, interventions and, uh, and partnerships uh, from establishing K-Lab to uh, Fab Lab, 250 startups, and uh, a number of other incubators uh, that we work hand in hand uh, to see that really uh, we enable and uh, we create an environment uh, for people that have ideas, both local and international or foreign, uh, that have ideas that uh, want to bring to market, or want to take them to other sectors, that they are facilitated in, in that process. And um, the second one is uh, what we how we work with uh, uh, mostly uh, established, kind of established uh, businesses, um, but to improve, improve their competitiveness. And um, uh, this uh, competitiveness comes hand in hand with also uh, creating linkages, uh, linkages with other, uh, with other, uh, partners, uh, it could be from the local um, uh, in different verticals, uh, but as well from internationals. We've over the years uh, we've established very great networks um, uh, in Asia uh, as well as in Europe. And um, some time ago, we were exploring with uh, with Israel. Uh, we have very good friends uh, with Israel. And uh, from, uh, of course, uh, most of you, some of you are familiar with the, uh, with the uh, Milken Institute uh, for Financial Innovation. Uh, you have uh, uh, our friends Ignite uh, that have been working and several others, honestly. Of course, uh, Caleb now uh, is, uh, is bringing Power African and, and quite a number of other players and friends. Uh, I think some of them are or even on here. And uh, these B2B uh, exchanges or networks that we tend uh, we try to uh, to broker or to uh, to, to, to make uh, is to create uh, win-win situations where companies uh, really that have or that believe they have synergies, uh, they have um, opportunities that they can share amongst themselves um, can do this. We believe that it's the businessmen, the business people know where the, the, the business is. Uh, so instead of pointing and telling them, giving you a bunch of uh, 
uh, documents uh, about strategy, this, that, and that. We, we tend to want to make a connection with another businessman uh, who has uh, vested interests in uh, making that succeed. So that's really uh, on that part. And uh, today, uh, maybe rushing through uh, the, the three is we are now uh, working on how do we increase adoption of technology in other sectors. And these sectors are ranged from healthcare, tourism, of course, because uh, it's a big honor, agriculture, as the as his excellence touched uh, point, and we know uh, very well uh, the, the strides that uh, Israel has made over the years um, in, in agriculture. And uh, then the fourth one is what we are trying to do in uh, enabling, uh, in, in enabling dig expanding digital exports or doing business from Rwanda to the rest of the continent, which we are calling Access African uh, Markets and International Partnerships. And this year, we believe is going to be key uh, with, our, with our collaboration with, our, with the Empire Africa uh, team uh, to see that we, we bring this to, uh, to, to reality and, uh, and we can facilitate uh, you, uh, the companies and the businesses that want to do business uh, in Rwanda, but also the Rwandans that are on this call uh, that want to, uh, to connect with, uh, with other international players. So, um that's uh that's it uh um, i don't know if that's enough for an introduction caleb uh, but uh, i'll pause here for, uh, for the start alex is always fantastic really amazing perspectives and just the depth with which you guys are working and the value with which you're adding um just through you're figuring out a way to facilitate these connections. And we definitely um, you know, see that there is the Rwanda value add. So it's about international companies coming to Rwanda and, and you know, finding value, whether it's in a proof of concept, whether it's in relation, you know, relationships and connections through the chamber and through the government, and next, uh, JJ is going to tell us about, you know, an, an international in, investor who came to Rwanda and built a company, and how they, you know, created created the and add, had add value added to them through that journey. So I'm going to pass it over to my dear friend JJ. Last at our last event in Kigali, I threw a mic in his face. This time I gave him a. <laughs> spontaneously this time it gave him a little bit more <laughs> more time to prep but always excited to hear your wisdom jj thank you so much for being here appreciate it. Uh, thank you caleb and uh thank you to everyone who spoke before me uh, and thank you to the audience as well uh good afternoon everyone uh from today uh my name is the uh jean jacques Ndaisenga, uh, JJ, and i'm currently the managing director of rwanda trading company uh, so a little bit about one trading company. Uh, it was founded in 2009 by an American investor, and uh, we uh, work with farmers around the country to buy their coffee harvest. We process it and then uh, we export the coffee all around the world, uh, mainly in Europe, uh, USA, all in China, uh, Asia, uh, Asia, and. Uh, as well. Uh, as a company, uh, when we started, uh, I remember the first year with very small volumes, uh, but over the last 10 years, we have grown now to do around 25% of all the Rwanda. And uh, we've, we have also, uh, we are very focused on acquiring sustainable uh, growth in the food sector. So, in our supply chain, we have a network of over 60,000 farmers. So we have developed uh, various uh, programs to train the farmers, make sure they can improve their productivity, uh, make sure they can improve quality, and so on. Uh, just to make sure that what we are doing is a business that adds value at the supply chain. Uh, now, maybe kind of 
a bit on uh, the topic of today. Uh, I think uh, uh, when it comes to the ease of doing business in Rwanda, I think many people it's easy to look at Rwanda and say it's a small country, it's a small population, and so it's a small and maybe sometimes we but for me, I look at those things as opportunities, especially given uh, the leadership of our country that has essentially taken being a small country, being a small population, and turned that into convenience. Uh, convenience that uh, when investing comes, uh, essentially, uh, you have uh, access to what you need to set up business. Uh, I think the government has done a good job in harmonizing the systems and the processes that, uh, you know, you don't have to figure out different things if you go from one region to the, of the country to another. And uh, you, you also have access to those same government officials who are, uh, are the decision makers and helping to guide the policy and so on. And I think, uh, that's really where uh, I see value that uh, Rwanda has made itself a convenient place for people to come and sell up. And then, uh, you know, even when you grow uh, beyond the market that we have in Rwanda, uh, at least you have that foundation from here that you can be able to uh, expand outside the country and uh, uh, turn into uh, a global, uh, you know, brand. Uh, in fact, I think uh, when our founder started in Rwanda, uh, it was the first time getting into the coffee sector, uh, but that has led into developing the roasting business in the US, uh, West Rock Coffee Company, and uh, also having a coffee trading house in UK. And so right now, the company is becoming a leader, uh, a global leader, one of the global leaders in the coffee sectors. So with that, uh, I guess uh, I can leave it for here and then I'll be ready for questions afterward. Thank you. Um, Israel, do you mind sharing a little bit about this, this founder and, and about your background, of course, as well? Oh, sure. Uh, so myself, Jean-Jacques, I, uh, I uh, hold a, a master's degree in the coffee economics and sciences from uh, University of Edna in Italy. And then I also have a bachelor's degree from Colby College in the USA. Uh, before I joined the, the company here in Rwanda back in 2014, I was working for a financial, uh, a health insurance company in the US as a financial analyst, Blue Shield of uh, California. Uh, and uh, so I joined the LHC Rwanda Trading Company first as an operations manager. And uh, I was uh, named the managing director uh, last uh, last July or July of last year. Uh, the founder of our business, uh, Scott Ford, uh, he uh, you know he first uh, came to Rwanda, uh, met President Kagame, and he started learning about all the uh, uh, the progress that the country was making and you know, the vision that the president had for the country. And uh, eventually he was invited to be on the uh, president's advisory council. So in that process, uh, as he was seeing all the progress and the facilitation that the country was putting in place, he found himself being uh, a preacher for people to come to invest in Rwanda. So after some time, he was like, what's the best way to preach uh, uh, you know, beyond like we are, it's better if I invested myself and then I could actually be telling people to come and invest because I've done it as well and it's working. So that's uh, that's kind of how it really started. Thank you. And his investment did pretty well. Yes. Awesome. So, uh, Israel. Now what I want to do is just ask, you know, we've we heard great things about your respective companies and the value the value add that's um you know been been created. Now I just wanna ask you guys, you know, freely as you know, you can take off your your company hats and you know put on your uh your personal hats. 
Israel, would love to hear any sort of perspectives that you have about you know the best opportunities that you're seeing in Rwanda, um, you know ideas that you have, other projects that you might be involved with, as well as any advice specifically for international startups from specific sectors that want to come into Rwanda to do POC. Imagine we're going to get this message out to every international innovator out there at the highest level who never would have thought of coming to Rwanda for proof of concept. What sort of you know messages and advice would you have you know would you have for them? But also you know what is the infrastructure you know in in, in case that would enable them to do that? So I'd love to hear you know and I'll go and ask the same question to to, to each of our distinguished guests before we before we wrap it up and get back to some networking and other sessions. But Israel would love to hear your personal perspectives on the opportunities in Rwanda, the other stuff that you're working on, what you're excited about, and what advice you'd, have, you'd, you'd share with any um, business person here in the audience looking to, looking to maybe you know benefit from some of that value that Rwanda has to offer. Um, thank you. I think because I happen to be a healthcare professional, I, I, I feel like um, uh, there is probably a, a missed opportunity in, in benefiting from uh, the acceleration that telehealth uh, or telemedicine has seen elsewhere in the world. Um, either we have some players like Babil and, and others, but I, I really feel like we, we didn't uh, capture the fact that even, you know, pretty much the entire country was going to, to be in-house and, and really kind of uh, get, get to accelerate that. So, um, um, it's 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 the business models that that kind of differ. It's also the different needs uh, that need to be there. Uh, this morning, I was actually reading a, an investment in an investment memo on, on one of those startups uh, in Kenya. Uh, they are really building a whole different way of approaching that, and and I really feel like uh, we, we do need a, a players in this country as well. And it's an untapped resource. Uh, we have a population that's kind of quickly. Uh, you know, penetration of internet is, is really being driven by the government in an unprecedented way. Uh, smartphones, we had a whole campaign last year to, to get like smartphone in as many hands as possible. And, and I feel like these are foundational aspects for many other people to come and build on top of that. Um, and, and I think there is also something around fintech. Uh, I, I feel like uh, there is a missing pressure on the banking sector on the banking regulators in terms of open banking, in terms of the future of fintech coming much closer to them. Um, so, so for me, those are like uh, at least two areas that I could speak on uh, that are really open for opportunities. Um, and, and when it comes to, you know, not really tips, but a, a personal perspective, it, it's usually the confusion that happens when you speak of proof of concept. Um, that is usually translated into small market and unable to scale. Honestly speaking, proof of concept is one thing. Um, the fact that Rwanda is particularly positioned in allowing you to just take to market something that you'd not take to market elsewhere in the world or uh, elsewhere, you know, where it's much more complicated from a regulatory perspective. Uh, but I also feel like there is some unique aspects of this market uh, that are untapped. And, and I see that with Zipline a lot in terms of... Um, you know, people think like now that we have two distribution center, we kind of reached our growth ceiling. I, I, I really feel like it's it's a it's a myth, and it's something that we need to debunk in as much as possible. Um, I think we we remain one of the most densely populated countries on the continent, so that means that um, as much as we have a small territory, uh, we have like operating and marginal cost that will always be low compared to let's say operating in a the second mostly populated country in Africa, which is Ethiopia or uh, or Nigeria, which is the most uh, populated. So you kind of realize like there are untapped opportunities around the fact that this is a country where a business can also scale and really capture a market in very different ways. And I'm starting to see that in local startups that are expanding in secondary cities in terms of, let's say, food delivery um, or, or even online shopping and e-commerce, and, and they are really kind of accelerating that penetration in the rest of the country. And, and I feel like um, that, the, you know, when you come to Rwanda and go to another city, like the city that I grew up in, in the south of the country, you'll see that it's just 
uh, it's the most it's a big university city everyone has a phone everyone is educated and and they are just not being served by the startup ecosystem or the entrepreneurship ecosystem and and for me it's it's mostly an untapped opportunity that is um, that is open and and waiting for uh, entrepreneurs and and people who have ideas and businesses that they would like to to expand um in in so many ways and the same it's people who are, have the skills and capacity who are who are just waiting for jobs to show up and and could be doing uh, amazing things and and speaking of jobs i think uh, there is also another myth that i i really like you know when zipline came to rwanda we didn't create jobs we found some of the most amazing mechanical engineers some of the most amazing um, electrical and uh, electronic engineers, some of the most amazing pharmacists and biomedical scientists to really take Zipline from, you know, zero to a hundred. Like the, the American teams that came, they couldn't do that. Um, and, and they probably wouldn't have brought people who knew how to do it better than the run and stuff. So it's really not about creating jobs, but it's more on the people are here, the skills are here, really smart folks, and they are able to even, you know, most of us, it's like myself, I joined the plan on the London team, and we are now able to take it uh, as way on the continent. And so that that's also a, a high, highly valuable um, and untapped resource that's there. And it's all over. It's it's really kind of dispersed all over the country. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I feel like the those are things that a lot of entrepreneurs can, can tap into. Um, and, and on that, I think I'll, I'll also excuse myself. Uh, I'll have to to jump off, I have a, a really important call to join right now. So um, thank you, thank you so much again for the invitation and uh, um, I, I look forward to, to staying in touch and keep engaging with everyone. Good, good, good luck, Israel. Thank you so much for closing. Um, okay, so we're, we're, we're just gonna take another five minutes here to give uh, Alex and JJ a chance before we hop over to the next session which you'll be able to access uh, by clicking on the button on the top of your screen, which will pop up. Thank you so much for your time and patience and apologize for the running behind schedule here. We, I could personally go for hours and hours more. Um, Alex, we'd love to hear your personal perspectives, insights, advice. This session is the Rwanda value add, which does not mean how international companies can add value to Rwanda. The opposite. How does Rwanda add value to international companies? You know, what are what are you seeing? You know, you've mentioned you've mentioned the trend, but what are the areas um, that you know you personally are excited about? Also, specifically, um, you know, I, I I know from speaking with a lot of international business people who hear about Rwanda, see an idea, and think that it has an application. Is if you can also address to you know what what should we not be doing? Right, not to not not to get negative here, but what are some of the things to avoid uh, as an international company that's thinking about doing something in Rwanda or is planning to operate in Rwanda? And what are your personal insights and advice for best practices? Um, honestly, I'm not so sure what not to do, but um, I know what to do. Uh, what to do is to same thing that I would do if I wanted to do business in the Middle East uh, or in Israel, uh, I would find a local partner. Um, I would find someone who knows the, the terrain, um, who knows what, what about the neighbors? How do I go about um, working with different cultures? The beauty of Rwanda is that uh, we have a good population of people that have come from the rest of the continent. Yes, Rwandans, but they've also like I, I said earlier, I grew up in Uganda. I went to school in Uganda. I'm Rwandan, but so I know I know Uganda quite well. And uh, the same will apply with uh, with people from different. Uh, some of our, our colleagues who've come from different countries um, in the region. So we know we, we have an idea, or at least so we have uh, better knowledge uh, in, in in this area, and maybe even a network. And that's, uh, I think, the, 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 the one thing that I would be, uh, that I would speak towards. Um, and then the, 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 the other, I think, uh, in terms of uh, opportunity is uh, coming, I'll, I'll come back to what everyone uh, is saying, but I think um, uh, Israel touched ab about it, open banking uh, or open uh, finance. This is, um, this is not just in Rwanda. 
uh, I think this is a space that is uh, prime for, for disruption. Um, banking systems or banking structures uh, uh, seem to be uh, following the same rule book uh, as, as it has always been, so shall it be now and forever. Uh, so the, the value add uh, that Rwanda brings on or Africa brings on since we're on the continent is the, the new, I'm not so sure how it is in Israel, but uh, the, the, the new channels, uh, mobile channels, uh, connectivity of over one point something billion uh, people that are quickly uh, connecting and uh, the landing or yeah, the, the landing spot launch pad uh, could be in Rwanda uh, or like Visa did uh, when they were launching their mobile uh, solutions. Uh, so I think that's where I, I can say that there's a uh, mix that up with ag tech, agriculture technology and working with farmers as uh, JJ um, and, and team are doing. And then uh, you have a, a quite a, a sizable market. Um, agriculture or food is going to be a, a, a very uh, good sector to play in uh, for as long as we all live. So, uh, and, and uh, there's uh, several things that, uh, that, that we can learn from each other. I think for me, that, that would be my take. Um, my takeaway. So mixing uh, traditional sectors uh, with tech, uh, but as well, uh, localization or contextualization is very, very, very key. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. I hope you can stick around in the lounge and network for a little bit. I'm sure that a lot of people uh, will, have, uh, will have more questions for you. Um, sure. Concluding with, uh, with, with, with JJ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do you see Rwanda going from here? You know, we saw the we saw the the beautiful animated video um, by our friend uh, Ridwan in Nigeria um, that is just growing and growing and growing. What's what what do you for, what do you foresee? What's it going to take to get? What's it going to take to get there? What are the opportunities? Where's the real value? You know, where where's the the ultimate value going to be created? Um, you know, and what would be your message, you know, to, um, you know, international businesses that want to come and set up businesses from scratch in uh, in Rwanda? Um, sure. Thank you again, uh, Talib. Uh, thank you. I think uh, as far as Rwanda is concerned, all I would say in the brief is that uh, the leadership and the people, they all mean business and they are committed. They want to see this progress continue. They want to see the investments uh, uh, and the progress already made uh, be sustained. Uh, now, uh, as far as uh, opportunities, uh, I uh, always tell people that, uh, you know, uh, agriculture is always going to be number one in the development process. Uh, if you look at the history of the entire region, this is what you were telling me uh, when you were sitting in Kigali. Please, please share this, share this uh, theory and perspective with everybody before uh, the next sure. session. Excuse me for yeah. You see the history of the developed countries, whether the USA or Europe, uh, they all started from agriculture. And then uh, eventually the agricultural sector matured to the level that people started producing more than they can consume. So when people were producing more than they can consume, then the whole development of manufacturing and the industry came in so that whatever was not consumed the fish could be manufactured for longer shelf storage, if I can say. Uh, and so once you have a mature manufacturer, manufacturing, uh, then you can uh, uh, start going to services. So I think there's still a lot of opportunities in, the, in agriculture, just because uh, I don't think our productivity is yet where it needs to be. And uh, if we can get more investments coming in to support the agriculture sector to keep growing, uh, and support that whole group of people who currently uh, you know, surviving on agriculture, 
then eventually it's gonna boost the whole system that uh, even uh, uh, manufacturing services, technology and so on can actually uh, grow further. So I think uh, as far as opportunities, I will emphasize on agriculture, uh, but uh, on the last question for people coming in to, uh, you know, set up uh, from scratch, yeah. uh, I mean, the easier thing or the one thing that everyone should know, uh, you know, the rules here are very clear and easy to follow. So if you really come to Rwanda, uh, you go to RDB, you, you have a booklet that tells you everything you need and oftentimes, uh, you would not need to deviate from those rules to, you know, be able to register your business or carry on whatever activities that you have to do. So I think that's really what's important and that's what should be encouraging everyone to come here. Thank you. Incredible. Um, JJ, thank you. Alex, thank you. Uh, thank you to Israel, who's hopefully doing something great with Zipline. I'm sure there are a lot of folks that are going to want to, you know, stick around and hear your hear your perspective. So if if you have some time to stay and pop over to the lounge, feel free to do so. But we know that Starbucks is your number one client, JJ. So take care of them, so our our friends in America and around the world can get their lattes and their <laughs> frappuccinos and whatever it is that that, that they need. Um, we're going to wrap this up here. Uh, we'll jump into the to, to the lounge and continue, you know, the here, which is talking with each other, not listening to me talk the whole time. So I just want to say thank you to all for for your time, for your insights, and we'll uh, we'll see you guys soon. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you. See you at the lunch.